Hi, I'm Rosie Acosta. I'm a meditation teacher, speaker, and author of You Are Radically Loved, a healing journey to self-love. Look, I grew up in East Los Angeles during the 92 LA riots, and it set me on a troubled path. I didn't grow up with mentors in my life, so I turned to reading as many books as I possibly could to learn about the purpose of life. In my journey, I found that having these conversations gave me life, and I decided I wanted to create a place where I could share these conversations with my community. So come have a sit with me as we learn about, well, everything. So hello, everyone. Welcome to a, another amazing episode of Radically Loved. I'm standing in for our host today, Rosie Acosta, who is over at Headspace, creating some wonderful new content for you all. And so today we are so honored to have a special guest here, Abby Morgan. Abby is a playwright and a screenwriter. Her plays include among many, I'm not going to read them all, but there's so many here that I'll just mention, Skinned, Sleeping Around, Slender. Um, And she's also writing for television. And and some of that work includes My Fragile Heart, Murder, Sex Traffic, Tsunami. Um, She has several films currently in development and has won a number of awards, including BAFTAs and an Emmy for her film and TV work. And so today we're going to discuss her book. It's called This Is Not a Pity Memoir, and I'm going to hold it up because I love the cover Um, just so y'all can see. This is not a pity memoir. And it's a story about love and family. It asks so many poignant questions. How do you bring back someone who relies on you for recovery and yet no longer recognizes you at all? How do you reckon with the shared years that came before? And most of all, how do you navigate this new life together? Just brief little synopsis, and then we'll dive into our conversation with Abby. She returned home one day to find her longtime partner and father to their two kids collapsed on the bathroom floor. Jacob, who had been undergoing treatment for multiple sclerosis, had suddenly experienced a series of seizures and had to be put into a medically induced coma. As he slowly regained consciousness after six months, he made tentative steps to communicate with those around him and grappled with the host of issues that had been triggered by the damage caused to his brain. But while Jacob recognized his family and friends, he didn't believe that Abby, standing in front of him, who had sat by his hospital bed, juggled care of their children, and liaised with his slew of doctors as he slipped between life and death, was, in fact, his Abby. Instead, he saw a woman who believed, whom he believed to be an imposter. Abby, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you. For, thank you for having me on. It's really lovely to talk to you. Yes. And so I was saying um, just before we hit record that I've been really looking forward to this interview for many months now. This came across my um, purview in the summer and I told Rosie right away, we have to have Abby on. This story is, I mean, I, 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 of course, I want you to speak to this, Abby, but to me, it reads like a a script for a drama or a TV show. It Mm. almost doesn't feel real, but it is very real to you. It is your life. Um, I think I would love to start off with talking about the title. This is not a pity memoir. What, what made you choose this title? Well, it was interesting. I think, you know, when a book goes out into the world, you have to really, you know, you scroll through Amazon and you see there are so many amazing titles. And, and so really it was, it was when I, it was a conversation with my, um, my book agent who really picked up on a really key story at the heart of the book. You know, a lot of the book is, um, whilst Jacob is grappling to, uh, you know, work out my identity. It, it forces me to go back through our relationship and right back to the beginning and the first um, time we ever met. And I actually met Jacob at a dinner party in a very, uh, you know, a way we often meet people, uh, you know, in our life changing moments, they often happen in the minor, not the major. Um but at that dinner party, I was, Jacob was sitting opposite me and um, he started to ask me a little bit about what I was doing. And at the time I was chasing the rights on a really beautiful memoir written by the journalist and writer Ruth Picardy, who was really writing about the last few months of her life as she um, slowly declined with with 
uh, cancer. Um, mm. But the thing about the book that was so moving was it was so funny, it was so witty, it was so relatable. And I was explaining to Jacob how much I loved this book and I was trying to see if I could make a film out of it and if the rights were free. And Jacob happened to be sitting next to a, a, a quite a flirtatious woman who was quite drunk and she leant forward and went, oh my gosh, I can't bear those pity memoirs. And really... Um, in a way, it became a sort of touchstone for me when when Jacob did collapse, you know, and I was reflecting on a relationship. I remembered his response and he went, really, I thought it was an amazing book. I thought it was brilliant. And mm. I really loved them. And his sort of open heartedness was the moment when I realized that there was something very special about him. And uh, it was quite a thunderbolt moment for me. And I guess I came to reflect on it again, you know, 20 years on after meeting Jacob and he had this, you know, medical catastrophe and a, a collapse and a coma. And then when he woke up. Uh, not knowing who I was, I started to think about how I was going to write this down. And so the title really comes from that very night when I was very keen to say, you know, this is not a pity memoir, really. This is a story of of love and relationship and marriage and medical crisis, but also about how Jacob and I found our way back to each other. So mm-hmm. um, I guess that was why the title felt very apt. And and uh, I'm very grateful to my book agent who said, you know, you've got to call it this. So, mm. so that was sort of how it finally landed. Yeah. Mm. So, it, well, this makes me think about the spark of when, as a writer, as a storyteller, really, um, you're looking on, uh, you're looking at taking on a new body of work or developing mm. a new story and it seems like perhaps, and correct me if I'm wrong, what happens is there might be a spark of, I want to learn more yeah. about this. I want to talk about this. I want to explore it. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you go about deciding to focus on a particular subject matter or take on a particular story? Well, it's interesting. I used to call it the dog whistle. You know, when I would, um, you know, when I would talk to producers or, um, you know, companies would sometimes pitch me, maybe it was an amazing source material or a beautiful, you know, a beautiful novel to adapt. Or sometimes it was a world or an experience that that um, I was either bringing to the table or they were bringing to me. And I used to talk about really searching for, I call it that moment where you prick up your ears and you hear something, even though it's not audible. <clears throat> to the everyday ear, but it's just something that profoundly hits you to your core. I mean, I would say that when I was hit with this experience, the writer in me kicked in me, and more importantly, the screenwriter. And I think if you've ever had a writer in the family or you've known a writer, you know that there's this kind of icy chip in us all, which is that however bleak an experience is or terrible an experience is, there's always that critical voice sort of looking at it slightly in a Nora Ephron way of it's all copy, it's all material. And so... Mm-hmm. I think, you know, in a way, I I had to apply the same rules that I applied when I look at any piece of material, which is I had to think, well, is this interesting? Is this going to say something that I didn't realize or experience before? Is it going to make a reader prick up their ears and listen? And I use myself as the, that barometer. You know, I think what is making me wake up? And I think such a profound and kind of extraordinary thing was happening. I say this in the context of, you know, we've just, as a, as a, as a globe, we've gone through this massive pandemic and everybody has their extraordinary stories of grief and loss and pain and medical, you know, um, crisis and tragedy and, and survival. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think that I have, it's a, I don't think it's an, uh, it's a particularly huge story, but I do, can, I do think there's something extraordinary in its ordinariness and that's something that looks very simple in terms of, you know, Jake and I had a very normal life together. We had two teenage children. Um, I, I realized that this, this moment in a moment, everything that I based my whole life on the whole brand of family, the whole, whole heart of who we were changed in a backflip. And I'm always looking for that moment when I, um, I'm searching to write something. I'm looking for something where I can feel there's a thesis somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. You know, there's something to be found, some transition that I as a writer will make and therefore hopefully bring an audience or a reader along with me. Because of course, as a screenwriter, I'm always thinking of an audience. And so it was very different for me to think in memoir terms. And and actually what I loved about writing the memoir was there was an immediacy to it. And there there is a kind of quiet trust and transaction I'm doing with a, a reader where I'm saying, can you come with the chaos of my mind here? Because 
I think the other very key element to this was that I wasn't just writing this because I'd been commissioned or that the check was going to be great when I finally delivered or, you know, I'd fallen in love with some actor who was going to play that lead and I wanted to do the best for them. I was writing it to kind of hold on to my mental health and, mm. you know, and find my way back to my soul and find my way back to somebody and try and understand how this had happened to us as a family, to us as a couple and to Jacob and, 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 and really what was happening to me within it. So, um, that also became a really important reason to write it was just trying to make sense and find form within the chaos of an experience. Mm, yeah. The last two years have been crazy. We've never experienced anything like this in our lifetimes. We never experienced such an effect on our mental well being. Unfortunately, a lot of us have been beaten down by anxiety, stress, and poor sleep due to all the uncertainty in the world. And if you're a working parent, you've had the extra difficulty of keeping your kids occupied 24 seven while trying to work from home. It's not an easy task. So if you're feeling extra exhausted and burnt out, you're not alone. There are tens of thousands of people in a similar place right now. The question is, what can we do to enhance our mental well-being? One critical thing I'm advising all of my family and friends to take is magnesium breakthrough daily. Here's why. Stress and anxiety deplete your magnesium levels. Low magnesium levels then contribute to more anxiety. It's like a vicious cycle. By supplementing with Magnesium Breakthrough, you can break that cycle because you'll be getting seven unique forms of organic full spectrum magnesium for stress relief and better sleep all in one bottle. Taking Magnesium Breakthrough will help you to experience more energy, stronger bones, healthy blood pressure, less irritability, a calmer mood, reduced muscle cramping, even fewer migraines. And because it supports mental wellness, Magnesium Breakthrough can help you to feel yourself again. Simply take two capsules before you go to bed and you'll be amazed by the improvements in your mood, energy levels, and so much more. You'll feel so much more rested and you'll be ready to take on the day. For an exclusive offer for my listeners, just head over to magbreakthrough.com forward slash radically loved and use the code radically loved 10 during checkout to save 10% off and get free shipping. That's www.magbreakthrough.com forward slash radically loved and use the code radically loved 10 during your checkout to save 10% off plus free shipping. That's www.magbreakthrough.com forward slash radically loved and use the promo code radically loved 10. Well, I'd, I'd like to hear in your own words, what this story is about to you and a little bit more about this particular story and what in your life, what moment, if there was one, if there, if you could pinpoint a particular moment when that voice, that pinprick, that dog whistle told you, this is the story to write. Mm. Well, I think, I suppose it's, it's a few things really. Um, I think that, you know, put very simply, you know, Jacob collapsed, um, with a brain seizure uh, as a reaction to a drug. He was on a the last phase of a drugs trial. And so this was a, this is, this was something that came out of that drugs trial. 21, it's believed 22 people collapsed as a result of this drug. So this extraordinary thing in itself happened. Um, but then I suppose in the process of Jacob, Jacob waking up and not knowing who I was, um, and having gone through six months of being in a coma where I really had to question his mortality and what we were going to be when he came around. Um, I think the one thing I never expected was the kind of trope and the cliche of someone waking up and not knowing who you are anymore. So that when Jacob woke up and really said, it was actually, it wasn't that he didn't know who I was. It was that it was the belief that I was an imposter. Mm -hmm. I guess the story is about one woman's journey to try and find her way back home. And what I came to see was that it wasn't that Jacob didn't know who I was. It was that he didn't know who he was. And there was a very key moment, actually, a few months after Jacob came home, after the 15 months he'd been in hospital and we started the rehab together. And I noticed him looking at himself in the hallway mirror as we were preparing to go out. And it was at that time, it was a, a kind of a juggle of putting on a coat and pushing someone up against the wall and hoping they could stand upright while you mm. gather together the various things because Jacob had huge physical and cognitive issues when he came home from hospital, um, I saw him look at himself in the mirror and I said to him, who's that? And I pointed his reflection and he said, I don't know. And I think that was a lightning, lightning bolt moment where I thought, okay, this 
I know what my mission is now. It's not that he doesn't know who I am. It's that he doesn't know who, who he is. And so the, the, the book is also about, well, I guess it's for anyone and it's about anyone who has been in love and has built a whole blueprint and a whole life with someone. And the realization that the essence of the people that we love is held within our cognitive electronic grid that we call our brains and when that brain is damaged a little like when a, an arm is damaged you do everything you can to try and heal that arm and yet unlike when you break your arm the whole root map of who Jake and I were who we were as a family who Jacob was as a person had been lost and so the book is really about how he and I together and us as a family both mine and Jacob's family and our children helped Jake reboot and inadvertently I think it, it it was also the start of a massive reset on our marriage together. So I guess it's about any relationship that is hit by uh, by an extraordinary th thunderbolt and about the journey to survive it and in many ways reconvene and reconfigure and reassess and come to terms with a new kind of relationship. Mm. And I know you you write, I think you, you do write about this, um, however indirectly or directly in, in the book, but tell us how how did you cope with this realization that he didn't recognize you at first? In mm -hmm. fact, he thought you were an imposter and, and that maybe he, he would never recognize you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a little bit like the book, you know, sometimes the, the book is in the first person <clears throat> I'm talking and the I and the you, and sometimes I'm talking in the third person and it becomes a he. And in many ways I did split off. You know, I started to talk to the Jacob I'd known. Mm -hmm. And every time, you know, when Jacob first knew and didn't woke up and didn't know who I was, I was acutely aware both of two things, how shocking and um and you know, terrifying it was, but also I kind of in the back of my head could feel Jake's voice going, I can't believe this. And me kind of feeling like, I can't wait to tell you this. You're not going to believe it. You know, it was so ridiculous and, and bizarre. And there was so much comedy to it. If I'm absolutely honest, you know, the first time he didn't recognize me, I'd presented him. It was Valentine's day. And I presented him with a cheesy red balloon heart. I talk about this in the book and I tied it to the end of his bed. And when he looked at this, this, this balloon, I saw this look of utter embarrassment and horror on his face because he didn't know who I was. It was like I was some kind of weird stalker lady. And I kept on thinking, he's going to just find this so funny. So there was, I think humor really helps. And I think, I hope it's uh, it's running through the heart of the book. But also, you know, when you build a life with someone, you leave your blueprint together. You build a house, you choose fabrics, you choose furniture. And then more than that, you mix the DNA. You mix the very DNA. We were fortunate enough to have at the time a 14 and a 16 year old. And so I had very visible evidence of Jacob and who he was and who we'd been together through them. And so, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, I guess it was this. I survived by, you know, leaning into my children who were the most amazing running partners, leaning into all the people who knew him. And I guess leading into the memories and the experience that I had with Jake. I think what I've come to realize is, is that the fight to survive is really profound and at the heart of all of us. And I think the book is a, and the experience of trying to bring but Jacob back was initially because I wanted to bring back my husband, my lover, the father of my children. And then over time, when I started to have to accept that maybe I wasn't going to bring back the Jacob I knew, it became a much bigger mission to bring back this person who I admired and I loved and I found very funny and I felt was important to the world, whether he was with me or not, and was certainly important to my children and to the wider context of our family. And so that became a much bigger mission. And so when I sort of released myself from needing to get Jacob back for me, I could then sort of really allow Jacob to breathe and allow myself to focus on working on getting him back. I mean, I suppose what I should say, and I'm sure you're going to come around to that, I also had in the middle of it this other sort of thunderbolt moment, sort of, you know, left a field curveball, which is that um, in January 2019, Jacob woke up from his coma and in about the March, April, he started his rehab. And at the same time that Jacob started his rehab, I discovered that I had a pain in my chest and I very quickly discovered that I developed stage three, grade three, um, triple negative breast cancer. And so uh, that was, I think, in many ways, one of the hardest things that had happened. But the gift of it 
was that it it made me have to start to think about my own mortality as well as Jacob. And so the fight for survival became a very real fight for survival for myself. And um, and actually inadvertently, I think that the cancer diagnosis and my subsequent treatment was one of the things that started to puncture Jacob's delusion because um, by about the spring, Jacob had started to accept that I must be somebody working for the state who mm. had come to help him. And actually, I always saw this as he gave me a window and an opportunity to stay in the room with him. So I, I played along with this, as did my children, as did the rest of Jacob's family. And it became very easy to be in the room then because he started to be grateful and polite and kind in the way that he would be to anybody who worked for him. Mm. But I think then when I developed breast cancer and he started to then come home and have to live with someone going through chemotherapy, he couldn't understand where that somewhere deep inside himself, he was feeling something more than he would feel for someone from the state. He was feeling a level of sadness and concern. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I guess there was a very key moment, which I described, which is we went out for lunch together just before Jacob came out from the hospital. And we, together, we looked like the odd couple, you know, I was going through chemo and he was, you know, both of us were very bloated from steroids and, you know, cognitively and physically, he was very cognitively and physically impaired. And over lunch together in a little outdoor Italian restaurant, he looked at me and I have a very flat back of the head. And he, Jacob always said it was because he thought I hadn't been moved enough, enough in my pram. It was a bit of a joke between the two of us. But he just stared at me and he leant forward and cut the back of my head. And he said, your your head is flat at the back. And I went, yeah. And he went like Abby Morgan. And I went, yeah, like Abby Morgan. And I just saw this flicker in his eyes of, God, I've, I think something's wrong here. I think I may have got something wrong. And it was really the start of a very, very slow back and forth ebb and flow that finally about a year to 18 months later led Jacob back to me and led Jake to start to believe that actually perhaps he had his brain had been damaged and perhaps he was misunderstanding who he was and perhaps I was the person who he'd spent the last 20 years together with Mm. yeah Fairity is all about clothing for life's best moments, whether it's the first day of school or hanging out with your family in your backyard this fall. They make clothes that feel good and make you feel good. This company was founded by twin brothers, Alex and Mike, and they grew out of a long time love of surf, mountains, road trips, and beach bonfires. You know that feeling for me, it is very SoCal. One of the reasons why I love Faraday so much is because they are so passionate about the craftsmanship and sustainability. And for any of you people out there who are not into fast fashion, I'm not, but I know that other people might be. I'm really about working with brands or buying brands that are really focused on sustainability. Every piece is designed to be a lifetime favorite. In fact, their clothes gets even better with age. I've had some of their pieces for many years now and One of my favorites, which I've talked about on the podcast before, is the one and done jumpsuit. It is my absolute favorite. It's the easiest outfit to put together. I can dress it up, I can dress it down, and the material, I'm not kidding, just gets better with age. And right now, Faraday is giving all of our Radically Loved listeners 15% off of every order. You heard me. You get 15% off of your order. Just head over to faradybrand.com forward slash loved and use the promo code LOVED at checkout to get this deal. That's code L-O-V-E-D at Faraday Brand. That's F-A-H-E-R-T-Y brand.com forward slash loved for 15% off. FaradayBrand.com forward slash loved. I can only imagine, and you you do discuss this in the book, the tremendous amount of support. I mean, this isn't something, of course, you mentioned your children that you did by yourself. But I mean, I can only imagine, yes, going through chemotherapy, writing a TV script, um, and then the onslaught of COVID. How, I think this is a two-part question and also a follow-up question to what you just answered for me is, staying sane through that Mm -hmm. and um, managing all of that at the same time as managing Jacob's recovery. Mm. 
So that's the first part of the question. And the second part, I think I am curious to know if looking back retrospectively, would you do anything differently? Um, well, the first part of that question um, was that, yes, I had a tremendous amount of help. I felt incredibly fortunate to have the family that I had, to have the family that Jacob had. We're, we're very close. And that, but that's not also to say that something like this is a grenade in a family. You know, it's, it's incredibly hard to always get it right. Um, mm. And that probably will nod to my second answer to the second half of that question. But but. Um, you know, I think we survived in so many ways. And I think I was incredibly unfortunate as a writer. You know, the screenwriter in me was able to work, was able, it's always been where I've gone to at the darkest times. Writing for me has always been a, a huge um, sanctuary and a resource for me to express myself. And, you know, I may be writing about the lives of, you know, a, a British prime minister or, you know, 1950s newsroom or, you know, um, a tsunami, but often I will find something personal, something universal in it that I can relate to. And so I guess my ability then to focus in on my own story meant that I also, I was able to write and earn money, which was a really key element to this, you know, because when someone comes out, you know, the care of somebody is hugely expensive. And unlike, you know, I was fortunate that I had some private healthcare, but we have a national health service that's very broken at the moment in the UK. So um, I had to, I was very fortunate. I was able to earn the money to give Jake significant amount of care, which then allowed freed me up to, you know, recover and work and, you know, go through my treatment. And, and you know, we were fortunate that we had some fantastic carers who came to live, you know, stay with us every day and work with Jacob every day on top of all the extraordinary therapies. Um I think it's a very interesting thing. I'm doing some legal um, processing of what's happened to Jake. So I'm reflecting back in a very kind of legal way of what's mm -hmm. happened to Jacob. And it's causing me to now at a, where we're, we're at a place where I feel we're on dry land. I'm really, there's, I realize there's another level of trauma and experience and analysis to, to go through. And I guess, you know, what I would say is that, um, I think there was a rage and a fury that both helped and hindered me. I think it helped me because it was my incredible drive. But I do think one of the hardest elements when someone you love deeply that you may have formed a really kind of, you know, an essential nuclear family with, um, you forget that they're owned by something much bigger, a much bigger family, a much bigger collector of, collective of people. And it that was something that was a huge asset in this experience, but also at times was really challenging, you know. Because Jacob was not only my partner, not only the father of my children, but also he was someone's son, he was someone's brother, he was someone's best friend. And, you know, everyone's instinct and natural impulse and important impulse is to help. But your identity is my identity as a partner, as a as Jacob's long term partner and friend had been blown out of the water by Jacob. Um, but also Jacob was no longer there as a family. And so it was very strange that Jacob was owned not only by the collective of doctors and nurses and therapists and family and friends and, you know, infinite number of people who wanted to support him. It's you're also trying to hold on to what you were as a group. And I think I would learn to lean into that more and not resist that more and try and um I think I was very accepting of help because I think people were incredibly kind. I don't know how kind I always was. And I think sometimes I was pretty monstrous. And, you know, the idea of, of a, a widow who throws herself on the coffin with grief, yeah. you know, I think I feel incredibly fortunate that I didn't ever, you know, we had some very close calls with Jacob, but he's still alive. But I do understand the passion and the intensity of wanting to save someone that you will just throw yourself on top of them. And, what I've come to realize is, is that when your own mortality comes into question, you also have to preserve and reserve your own strength to, in order to keep yourself going through that. So what I say to people, and I've had lots of people contact me as a result of this book, you know, people who may be going through long-term intensive care, you know, um, visiting or, you know, long haul care in any kind of way, or, you know, those dark nights of the soul, I say to them, just be really kind to yourself and you don't need to go in every day. That's the key thing. And I guess what I would have done differently is I probably would have given myself more of an out and, you know, because it was very relentless. And I would say that was of all our family. Everyone was so incredibly committed to helping, helping Jacob that I think at times we all slightly lost ourselves. Um, so I guess that's something that I, I kind of learned from it and that I maybe do differently. I mean, one of the funny things is that, you know, short of bringing in a kind of 
majorette band and chorus line of showgirls to, you know, dance and sing for Jacob while he was in his coma, because I think we were also desperate to make sure he didn't lose and we look, you know, lose contact with the world. I realized that we were, it was about us trying not to lose contact with him. And then when you ask Jacob about that near seven months when he was in a coma, if he remembers anything, and it's a little bit like when you've had any kind of anesthetic, you know, a, a medically induced coma, you're placed in a, in a, in a, a kind of operation state. You know, if you've ever had one of uh, an anaesthetic, it's, you, you know, a, the anaesthetist is counting down and the next minute you're waking up. So the time gets compressed. So Jacob has really no memory of that seven months. So whilst we were playing him songs in the hope that he was staying connected to it, I I, I think um, rationally he probably has no memory of it. I still think on a soul level it was as important for us as it probably was for him. Um mm but I would probably allow myself some time to, to support myself and support those closest to me a little more. Yeah, absolutely. I can only imagine that this has profoundly shifted your experience of yourself as mother, um, your career, your relationship mm. to your work, um, your relationship as a wife. Mm. And doing all of that simultaneously. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, how has that shifted your relationship to those ideas of who you are? Well, I think one of the things that, that's profound at the heart of this is that, you know, as a writer, I've dealt with deadlines my whole life. Mm -hmm. You know, I work to deadlines. I I think I generate adrenaline with deadlines, but the, the greatest deadline, which is the ultimate mortality, I had I had taken no regard for that. So I, I guess on a profound level, I try and recognize that life has its limits and yet the experience while we live, it should not. And so I really try and live in the moment. And it's, I know those things, those things sound like platitudes you put on a t-shirt, but when you've gone through this experience, it's actually not hard to live like that. You do live like that much more. You know, I do feel there is a, you know, we were very fortunate, you know, it took, it's taken a lot of rehab and a lot of care and a lot of love to get Jacob back. And it's not been without its um, losses, mm -hmm. but Jacob is back and he's incredibly dynamic and so much of who he was is back. And physically he's, you know, whilst he has, you know, physical issues and some cognitive issues, he can now survive without a carer every day. For example, he lives a relative you know well cared for but independent life and there's a joy to that every single day there's a joy when I pick up the phone to him and he answers now and he's funny and witty and the person that I knew and so that's very grounding and that that keeps me very centered so I guess what it has done is it's made me you know it's the old adage you don't when you're facing your death you don't you don't think god I wish I'd spent more time in the office you do feel infinitely grateful for you know the Christmases and the crazy holidays and the significant conversations and those beautiful dinners and those moments, those simple moments when you walk the dog together, you, those are the things that you hold on to. And those are the things I try to fill my life with, but I, I profoundly respect and love and feel huge admiration for that artist in me who kept me going, who said, it's okay. You're you're you've lost everything. So let's let let's my skills let's the skill kicked in that's at your heart, which is that you're an observer and you want to express and you want to communicate. And as hard as this experience is, perhaps if you find a way to communicate and talk and express this experience in some way, it may release you and it may transport you and it may help you survive this experience. And I I so I still love writing. I still you know I'm in the middle of a new show for Netflix at the moment and. Um, I think I try not to work at weekends anymore and I try and take better care of myself, but I still intensely love my writing and I still feel so grateful that I was able to write my way through this experience. Hmm. Yeah. I was just going to ask you, uh, what you were working on next and you mentioned a Netflix series. Hmm. Very different world, 1980s, New York. Um, about a kind of crazy puppeteer and a, you know, a, one of America's leading puppet shows and whose, whose child goes missing. And it sounds incredibly bleak, but actually it's really about, it's about fatherhood and identity and, um, the magic of childhood and how we find our way back to our, 
our, our, our own children and within ourselves. And uh, and I think I wanted to transport myself to a very different world to the one I'd experienced recently, really. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Uh, when does that, are you at liberty to say when that is we start shooting. Out? We start shooting in January. So it'll be the end of next year, I imagine. Okay, wonderful. Very cool. So I want to be mindful of your time. I'll ask you one final question. Um, and then, uh, well, before I do that, where can people go to find out more, you know, connect with you and follow you and, and find your fast body um, of work? You can find me at Abby Abby M or at Abby Morgan nine on um, Twitter and Instagram. Um, and I guess, you know, IMDB, that's the best way if you want to find out my other shows. But I mean, I, sh- I have a show called The Split, which I think has been on an AMC over there at the moment. Um, mm-hmm. So but I, I move between film and TV. Mm-hmm. So that's probably the best place to find me. Mm, thank you. Perfect. We'll make sure that links to those um, websites get into the show notes so that people can find you easily and follow along with your work. I'm curious to know if there's anything that you um, that got left out of the book that you you wish could have been in there or that mm. anything left that you would want to say. Well, I think what's interesting is that um, I've sold the film rights of my book to myself uh, in terms of I will adapt this as a film. And one of the reasons why I've been thinking about doing that is, of course, there is a sort of last chapter that isn't in the book, which is, you know, and I keep thinking about how, that last chapter, which is where Jacob is at now, really, or certainly um, where, you know, the, the massive recovery he's he's really experienced in the last nine months. And the book really ends um, around spring 2021. And of course, the last year has been very significant in the changes. But in many ways, the book really ends when the kind of first circle of the profound experience of Jake's collapse and then recovery and my recovery and the start of our coming back together again. The book ends at that moment. And in some ways, I don't know how much more there is to tell, actually, because the book really is about when you when we thought everything was lost, that moment when I start to feel a sense that we may be able to find our way back home again. And I guess um, there is a kind of completion to that. Um, but I, I suppose, you know, I think what's interesting is that the book is written to Jacob and people often say, what did Jacob think of the book? And Jacob's never read the book. And the irony was, I guess one of my key audiences was him. Um the book's quite traumatic for Jacob and it's, 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 you know, it's been a process for him to start to talk about what's happened to him. And I think one of the things that's been great about, you know, doing interviews, doing podcasts like this is that Jacob has slowly started to pick up the paper trail of, of the story. And, you know, he's infinitely proud of me and very supportive of, and a real believer in the importance of transparency in telling your story, which has been really, um, generous and and I'm incredibly grateful to for him but I guess one of the elements is for Jacob to turn the camera to turn the page on Jacob and allow Jacob to look back at this experience Mm -hmm. and so I'd probably try and capture a little bit of that what that's been like that process after the book's come out Mm -hmm. and what that story's what that's like to be put that story out into the world again Mm -hmm. yeah I find that so true when when something like an epic novel or um, a TV series that you just fall in love with comes to an end, it's always kind of hard to let go and say, okay, well, I guess those lives will continue on without me. And I'll I'll just have to wonder and dream a little bit about what that looks like. So I deeply empathize with this, this idea you're bringing forth. And Abby, I just want to thank you so much for your time and for your your honesty, your vulnerability, and for being here with us today. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Loved podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie, on Instagram at Rosie Acosta, and Twitter at Rosie Acosta. By the way, this is original music by DJ Taz Rashid. You can follow DJ Taz on Spotify and check out the best music for yoga and meditation. This has been a Mod Pod Studio production. Check them out at www.modpodstudio.com.